you can about psychology and the consciousness and not being troubled with the vision itself it was possible for me to imagine complex internal systems and so i have this uh, this um, this marvelous opportunity to run an internal show like like a, a director a movie director what is that subjective experience like because i mean it sounds like a sort of ongoing hallucination of sorts Yes, yes, that is exactly what it is. But of course, it is anchored to reality. In that, you know, the physical senses, my hearing and my touch and smell, taste, locks me into a reality which which excludes the possibility that this would be just hallucination. My imagination merely allows me to play in it, to live in it, to create in it, to feel in it. But in it, it remains reality always. Zoltan Tory on ABC Radio National and internationally on Radio Australia. This is All in the Mind. I'm Natasha Mitchell. This week with insights on sight from the minds of those who are blind. Dr Amir Amedi is instructor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and a research fellow with the Centre for Non-Invasive Brain Stimulation at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Centre. He and colleagues have been working with blind people to see how their brains... See, And it seems the part of their brain that would usually be dedicated to sight, the visual cortex, becomes colonised by other opportunistic senses and capacities. We used to think that about 30% or, or even more of the brain is dedicated to vision and to vision only. And then what we found is that even in adult people, the, the brain is capable of changing so it can be activated by different uh, modalities. In one study, you blindfolded seeing people for up to five days. Exactly. And you noticed that the visual centres of the brain, which is a large proportion of the rear of our brains, actually became co-opted for other sensory skills like touch or hearing, which is extraordinary in just that short amount of time. Exactly. And in another study, which we performed both on sighted and blind people, we use something that is called sensory substitution. It's a device that takes the images and translate the shape of the objects into, into sight, into vision. And then what we found out is that part of the visual cortex, uh, which is called the occipitotemporal cortex, which usually is activated by visual object recognition, but not by auditory object recognition. So just to check, you actually took pictures of objects and turned them into a sort of equivalent sound. Exactly. Uh, by, How interesting. For example, in our case, it's a device after about four weeks of training, people start to being able to recognize objects using this device only by, by hearing them. So the visual part of the brain is actually used to identify objects through sound. Exactly. So it becomes really confusing. What is the brain doing? Is it doing vision? Is it doing addition? Is it doing touch? Maybe the way to look at it is not asking to be a, a little bit chauvinist, you know, or this brain is, region is just doing this. It's just doing the vision. It's just doing touch. And if we will understand better the interaction between the different senses, we would gain a better understanding of how the brain functions and how we can maybe help in these uh, cases of blindness. And Dr. Amedi and colleagues have found it's not just hearing that takes over the visual centres of the brains of blind people. When they read Braille through touch, the visual cortex is uniquely activated too. And it's also activated when they're remembering words and numbers, which you also don't see happening in the brains of sighted folk. And actually their uh, memory skills, their verbal memory skills, much higher than the average uh, capacity of sighted people. And verbal memory just means the memory we use when, when we remember words. Words or even numbers, their verbal memory capacity is much higher. And what we found is that actually... Their left visual cortex is uh, recruited and robustly activated when they are doing verbal memory uh, a task which have nothing to do with vision. Right, but what are, about the rest of us? Do we activate the same part of our brain when we're, when we're remembering words? No, we are activating uh, other brain regions such as the prefrontal cortex or the parietal cortex. You've actually worked with a person who was totally blind for all their life but who could paint beautifully, three-dimensionally, objects that he'd never seen with the perspective right and everything. Yeah, actually, it's a very exciting uh, opportunity that uh, his name is Esref Armujan, and he's a, he's a blind uh, Turkish painter, but he's able to basically represent 
to a sighted person's uh, visual scene just by, by his touch uh, uh, and by drawing by touch. So he basically draws with one finger on a rubberized plastic uh, board which he can feel the identification of what he's drawing. He can understand concepts of such as vantage point. So he can, uh, we would give an object and ask him to paint it uh, or draw it uh, from the top. Uh, and he would be able to do it. And the second thing we were uh, very interested in is what's going on in his brain and imaged his brain while he was drawing objects. And indeed, we found that his uh, visual cortex is strongly recruited when he's drawing objects. So he was drawing objects by touching them? Yes. Or, or were the images also coming from nowhere? Some of his painting is, is really amazing. For example, he draws uh, someone uh, playing under the ocean while fishes are, are, uh, are wandering around. So some of his stuff is, is, uh, is pretty abstract. But he's also uh, being able, uh, for example, when he visited the Metropolitan Museum, he would touch a sphinx and then draw it. The team Amira Medi is with uses a technology called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. With it, they can temporarily block the activity of different parts of the brain, just for a moment. Blocking the activity of the visual cortex in blind people, it turns out, dramatically compromises their performance on verbal memory tasks. Not the case for sighted people. So it seems the visual cortex is being co-opted in important ways in the minds of the blind without them ever having a visual experience. To switch just to hearing and touch as a source of information would be a terribly impoverishing experience. If to be blind means that you can't see, then I'm of course not blind because I'm seeing all the time and generating vision all the time. Really, I feel, Natasha, exactly the same way in which you would feel if you would now close your eyes. Which I've just done, actually. (laughs) For 10 seconds. Now, during this time, you would still feel yourself unaltered with your identity, with your looks, with your appearance, with your memories, with your capabilities, you would not feel blind. No, no, I don't don't feel blind. I, to me, sometimes it comes as a surprise. Sometimes I say to myself, goodness me, I, I can't see a bloody thing. <laughs> I'm interested to know how you use your other senses and what role they play in sight. As, as you mentioned, the Royal Blind Society told you way back when you should let go of vision and focus on touch and smell as your means of rebuilding your mental representation of the world. So how do touch and smell and hearing fit into your visual experience? Well, uh, in an auxiliary sense only, uh, my concentration and my focus, my sense of reality is so embedded in the visual cortex mm. that, for example, when I do, uh, do something, pour a cup of coffee or I hit a nail into a piece of wood, <clears throat> I see the thing and if I would look away, quote unquote, I would fumble. I would not be able to pour that that uh, water into the cup or I would not be able to hit the nail on the head properly. The the take-home message in all this is that uh, the brain can accomplish a great many wonderful things if you stick to it and if you induce it. Professor Parwin Sinha, if I can come to you, if someone has been born blind, as with the subjects that you're working with in India, and they regain their sight later in life, how do they regain their sight? I mean, where does it start? I mean, do they start by seeing a cow as a cow, or do they have to train their brain to see as much as training their eyes to see again. Yeah, it's very much a matter of training the brain. So when we, on the first day, when you remove the bandages, the child really does not make sense of the the world. They report uh, that everything looks very bright, the colors are very vivid, but if you ask them to count the number of objects that you put on a table in front of them, they have a hard time even doing that. So it takes a while for them to, to begin to parse 
the world meaningfully. Mm. If we're drawing on Professor Amadi and colleagues' work, where it's obvious that the visual parts of the brain in blind people are become co-opted by smell and touch and verbal memory and language, then in the population of young people that you're studying... I wonder if their visual parts of their brain, when they start seeing again, have to sort of unlearn their preference for touch and sound and smell. That is truly a fascinating question. In fact, we will begin imaging uh, these children beginning this summer. And that is precisely the question we are starting out with. Would it be the case that after the onset of sight, vision will be able to reclaim uh, the territory? Have you got a hunch? Uh, <laughs> not yet, not yet. Uh, <laughs> we have some preliminary data, but they're so preliminary that I wouldn't even... Uh, dare to comment on uh, them. Dare to comment I on mean, them. I wonder, you know, you could speculate that as they're learning mm. vision, their smell might actually become less skilled or mm. their touch might become less sensitive. I, I wouldn't really say anything much about, about the experimental data that we have, sure. but that does seem to be the case very preliminarily. Mm. Well, on ABC Radio National, you're tuned to All in the Mind. I'm Natasha Mitchell, and my guests today are Professor Pawan Sinha from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, head of the Prakash Project, and also Dr Amir Ahmedi at Harvard Medical School. A final question for you both. I wonder what all this work and, and effort that you're directing towards understanding the brains of blind people says about the brains of people who see. I think that the main take-home message is that our brain is uh, much more dependent than we previously considered on interaction between the different senses. And there is a a lot of plasticity that is possible and that the brain is capable of uh, quite radical plasticity. Professor Sinha. Yeah, I would echo that. The key message is that the brain retains its its youth or its ability to learn well into adulthood. So even those of us who are old, what we would think as being old, we can still expect to learn a great deal of new stuff. That the brain can compensate for, say, damage to one part of the brain. So it essentially becomes a very dynamic learning system rather than a static uh, processor of information. Well, look, I find both of your work absolutely intriguing and and good luck with the continuation of it. Professor Pawan Sinha at MIT and Dr Amir Amadi at uh, Harvard Medical School, my thanks for joining me on the program this week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pao and Sinha, Associate Professor of Vision and Computational Neuroscience at MIT. And I'll link from our website to Project Prakash, his humanitarian and scientific effort to restore the sight of Indian children with prolonged congenital blindness. And if you think that wasn't enough strings to his bow, he's also an accomplished cartoonist and he and his students go down in the Guinness Book of Records too for publishing the world's tiniest book a five by five millimetre New Testament. There you have it. And before him, Dr Amir Amedi from Harvard Medical School and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Centre there in Boston. Not everyone who loses their, their sight react, is able to reactivate their mind's eye in the way that you have. Have you, have you spoken to people who are blind about that <coughs> and about your own experience? Not really. I don't know what makes the difference. I think um, love of life to begin with, Mm. love the process of life, the opportunity and the privilege to be able to participate in it and to make sense of it. It's it's, it's a wonderfully rich business. Magical. Zoltan Tori, thank you so much for joining me on the program this week. I I appreciate it very much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Zoltan Tory, and you can read his memoir Out of Darkness, published by Picador. His other book, The Crucible of Consciousness, is about to be republished by MIT Press. And this whole idea that our brains are incredibly adaptable and plastic, even for adults, holds interesting possibilities for a bionic eye or a visual prosthetic, even a retinal chip, to help restore the sight of people who are blind. But would near enough be good enough? That's the show next week. Don't forget you can download us as a podcast or stream us for four weeks. The transcript goes up later in the week. Head to abc.net.au slash rn slash all in the mind and email us from there too. Go on. Thanks this week to producers Anita Barrow, Kyla Brettel and to sound engineer Tim Simons. I'm Natasha Mitchell. Join you next week. Take care.